well, I want to uh, introduce and thank Todd Fine for uh, walking us through what he has discovered as a uh, as an amateur and as an enthusiast in this area. Uh, and we're going to have some fun learning about this amazing and powerful uh, artificial intelligence uh, technique uh, software platform. And uh, I think this is you know, this is an early sign of what's to come, and we'll have a lot of fun with it. So, Todd, it's uh, okay. It's yours. All right. Um, well, as Jr. mentioned, I am just kind of a hobbyist amateur dilettante programmer, but I, I always like to follow um, the new APIs, the new machine learning things to see how I can integrate them into creative projects. And there's been so much hype about this GPT-3 that I thought, well, why don't we have a, why don't we introduce it to the Make, uh, Make Haven community? Maybe we can have some discussions about it. People who haven't heard anything about it can 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 play with it a little bit um and we can have have some discussion so um i'm just gonna first just introduce it now can you i think you can see is this is that's not big enough for people to read the text is yeah. it? We, we can see it but you might want to go to present mode yeah okay the problem then is i lose the i, lo I can't see you anymore but that'll be okay oh, for now yeah so okay i'll go to present mode so um GPT-3 um, is this big new uh, text creation model. Um, and it's most, it's apparently most remarkable, not because of any new theory uh, that it's developed. All of the, all of the uh, modeling uh, techniques, all of the machine learning techniques were known, uh, but what's unique about it is the amount of, of power and uh, uh, training time that it was given. So it's based off uh, just 45 uh, terabytes of text data, which is obviously a lot, quite a lot. And 60% of the training data came from this thing called Common Crawl, which um, is just this massive repository of lots of things that have been produced on the internet. So it was probably almost certainly trained with some of our, your own, you know, text, tweets, uh, blog post, um, Thing, uh, various things. And it this training data, at least of Common Crawl, uh, is uh, 410 billion tokens. And for people who, are, um, who aren't too familiar with um, natural language processing, a token is not quite a word, but it's either part of a word or some kind of, uh, it's like a word, but it could in include a punctuation. Uh, it could include, you know, part words that have multiple components to them. But one way to think of it is a, a word. Um, and so it it takes all of this massive amounts of text, and really at the bare minimum, I mean, there's there's I don't I decided not to go through exactly how it works. Um, I felt that that would be a little too complicated, and I would lose people. But the very basics is it analyzes these, you know, trillion, almost a trillion texts, or I guess almost clear, nearly a trillion words, and just has a model predict, go through a sentence and, or, or, or larger a passage, and then get to the next word and predict what the word would be. Uh, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't uh, predict the words very well at being trained on this massive uh, repository, it will then update its model, just like any other um, large neural network. And uh, neural networks are basically, for people who aren't too familiar with them, are just these huge linear uh, linear uh, algebra problems, which are just these uh, basically solving a uh, the slope of a line in, in huge multi-dimensional space. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't have any knowledge of or it doesn't it's not taught with any rules about what language is. Um, I, I guess besides it has maybe has a very primitive vocabulary and grammar that it's trained with at the start. But beyond that, it doesn't have um, it knows like what I guess the subject verbs are that that type of thing. It has this very initial training. But beyond that, it doesn't have any knowledge of of what words mean of what the English language is, um, what the world is like. It's really just trying to create a model that can predict uh, the next word or the next passage 
when uh, when confronted with with a given uh, array of tokens or text. Um, there are a few websites that use some diagrams that kind of show a little bit more about how this specific uh, model works, like uh, like um, deep learning algorithms that some people may be familiar with. There's kind of these chains of uh, a transcription uh, where it, it kind of reduces uh, the the context to things that are adjacent. People may know that for like um, for all these new visual algorithms, it's not necessarily looking at all of the words. Um, in it's not looking at all of the pixels in an image. It's kind of focusing on the the uh, pixels that are immediately around a given point to produce structure. If does that make sense? So it's not it's not it's not taking every possible word and giving it the same meaning. It's dividing up its neural uh, network processing into sort of units that that privilege words surrounding or passages surrounding uh, the immediate context in order to sort of allow it to focus in on the specific parts of a sentence. Um, so not every word in like if you had, let's say you had a, a paragraph of a word, a paragraph that you were reviewing, um, you you would the model privileges the words that are close to each other. Um, and they use kind of techniques to allow that to uh, allow those connections to be made. The, the word that's at the beginning or the end of the paragraph or the passage doesn't have the same weight um, in the calculation of the model. That's 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 kind of the, the basic gist of it. And there are different models and different ways to formulate neural networks that can be tweaked to uh, to adjust that. But the, the basic point of it is it's just it's just a big vector uh, that it's it's submitted and it can uh, produce output. And in this case, uh, it's context window, what it calls its context window of what it can uh, what it can put out or what it can deal with is 2000 uh, 48 tokens of text, which is, you know, which is, which is a limit, you know, it can't write a book, it can't analyze an entire book, it can just kind of analyze these, you know, several paragraphs of text, but um, it can do a lot with that. Um, as I said, there's no new theory, it, basically, um, now, the, I, I, I haven't explained who did this. So this was, this was all sponsored by OpenAI. Um, which people may know is uh, is run by Elon Musk or was founded by uh, Elon Musk, and he uh, he has put I guess hundreds of millions of dollars into this. So the cost of training this model, they people estimate at least if that you were to have to do it on uh, like renting from Amazon GPUs from Amazon, it would cost about five million dollars, and it's about I guess people said about um, five hundred years of GPU time. Or something like that. So uh, it's it, it would cost uh, people a lot of money to do, but it's not. There's nothing new in it, and and for some for that reason, a lot of I guess researchers are kind of scoffing at this because this is very clearly a commercial endeavor, and there's not necessarily anything new about it. What's uh, remarkable is is what it can achieve, and it's actually based on a previous version, a GPT two, which came out. Uh, several years ago, or a bit, I think of, no, maybe not so about a year ago, um, but it uh, it was not released publicly because of actually fears of some of the negative aspects of it. it, you know, potential discrimination, racism, junk that was coming out of the model. And it's kind of curious that they've decided to make this one public, even though they can't necessarily explain how the reasoning that they gave for not releasing the previous version has been solved, which is, I think, uh, an ethical question that we're going to we're going to talk about a little bit, um, hopefully, in this discussion. Um, but uh, it was it was there was a paper that was given in late May explaining what they had done, this this AI research team, and they opened this uh, API uh, to public researchers in at the beginning of June. Uh, June 11th, um, and you can apply on the a on the OpenAI website for access to this. Um, and since then, there have just been a lot of uh, amateur or professional programmers, uh, artists, experimenters who have been playing with it on the internet. And I think people just generally have been have been a lot of people have been blown away 
at what it's capable of the the realism of the text it seem its sense of understanding meaning and it having thrust and direction in its writing and it's just its ability to mimic um human creations um the api can generate um text of up to 50,000 characters with given any prompt so basically the way it works is you give the api some prompt of text that you want to train it on um, well, you could both train, you can give it text to train it on so it knows what type of text it can produce. And then you give it a prompt to start off um, the, uh, the, the uh, a, a, a result that it would then produce. So you can actually you could do it in two ways. So you could you can train a new model based off of some prompt text, which is the type of text you would like it to simulate. Or you can just use its existing uh, model to then give it a prompt and it will try to complete the text up to up to whatever uh, amount you want it to. Um, so you can right now apply for beta API access. I applied maybe three or four weeks ago and I still haven't received access. So a lot of people haven't actually gotten to use it. Um, I'm one of them, but there is a shortcut and we're gonna, I guess, uh, play with that. Now, actually before before we, we, we play with the example, the way to shortcut. I just wanted to show it out. Here's an example of an essay that the the um, the AI wrote. Um, it's actually the essay was actually longer than this, but this is just a paragraph, and this was being shared on the internet. So somebody trained the AI on this point um, where they they pointed out that um, people might want to kill like kill off their identities, what, just like we have. Um, lives where our, our lives end, wouldn't it be more interesting if we could live forever, maybe we would kill off our identities like we're playing a, a video game like uh, World of Warcraft where you kill off your character or play a different character. So somebody wrote this first kind of tweet or very casual remark. I think information suicide, is there a better term for that? That's not so depressing, identity switching, interesting for the same reasons that other people find longevity interesting. And they trained the model just on that and then they told it to write an essay. And I think the way they did that is they had it like, they said, type my blog post by so-and-so on this subject. And then they told it to write the essay. And this is what it came up with. I get it, I, but I've always been more interested in the other lever, resets. There's little reason identity should persist across 80 or 200 years. French foreign legionnaires and cheating husbands always have presumed new identities. And the identity persistence has only recently happened as a result of strong government record keeping and centralization. If we're going to pursue biological longevity, we should allow a diversity of lives to be live, lived. So maybe it's just that I don't see why our first lives should be the only ones that we can explore. Maybe we can have lives for different spaces in our in our limited time, or maybe this is just wishful thinking on my part. So this was this is this was a blog post that was I don't know it was like five or six paragraphs. This is just a part of it, but that was lucid, that made a coherent argument, an interesting argument that people hadn't, you know, isn't a common argument that people would make normally. Uh, so it it's not clear if it would, if it could even, you could say that it was trained on this argument before. It just took this very kind of rough, you know, one sentence or two, one or two sentence description of an argument and turned it into a lucid, intelligent uh, five or six paragraph essay. Uh, so this was one example of something that kind of blew people's minds. Um, um, so before we, before I, I continue and we have discussion, I thought we would just, sh I will show um, some examples of of what what it can do. So because uh, the API is not available to the public, uh, people are trying to find shortcuts to play with it. And one one, th one thing that a lot of people are using is a program that. Um, is available on the web and also on your phone called AI Dungeon. I don't know if anybody has heard of this uh, before. It's it's kind of like uh, you know you know it used to have Zork those text adventure games where you'd say pick up key put key in door. Um, somebody had been running a, a thing like that already based on AI and they were able to get access to the uh, the API and adapt it for um, for this. Uh, purpose. So you can actually play with the GPT-3. Um, can you see that window now? 
so you are a cyborg. You have a, a bionic arm. You see a woman being harassed by three thugs. You decide to walk away, stop them. You walk away. So it's uh, this. This is a good example. It's already making decisions in the game. It's a little odd. You walk away as you continue. You reach a crossroads. You know that you need to get home quickly because you have an early shift tomorrow, but you don't know which way to go to get there. You could left down the bit. You know, this is a good example of the, for whatever reason, the tech started making its own decisions within. So it didn't do it proper very well. Um, you, ha you have to be creative with this. I want to go back to the custom one and try something a little different. Um, this, this is a messed up one. The word you was in every sentence in that one too. Yeah. I think that's key. One thing you can also do is ask questions. You can, or you can set up text that like um, that answers questions to show that it's not just story taking. So you could say, "What is two plus two? Um, and you could say, "Oh, wanted to add, answer for it." See, it knows to answer. So now we could add, we could ask new questions and it will kind of emulate this. Oh. So what's a question that we could ask it? Um, the meaning of life. That's a good one. All right. Life is a deep well. That is what? kind of a creepy. It has a lot of dark creepy answer. <laughs> and it also added extra questions. Yeah, and this is I it's acting really weird today. I you know, one of the things is it's a very fickle thing. Sometimes I wonder if it's changing its model and this thing can't you know, the the open AI people have been changing their models and this thing can't keep up. Hmm. Question What is the why don't we ask it like a factual question like how far away are we from the sun? Ninety-six million miles. That's the answer. Mm. So yeah, it created its own questions. So where does it get these answers from? So that's what's remarkable. It doesn't have a, it doesn't have, you know, a, a, a database of knowledge as we would think. It's just made associations through this massive model. Um, and it's able to reproduce those associations in, in responses that look like factual answers. But what's remarkable, and I think I'll, I'm going to transition to this, is this has some downsides in that it's always probabilistically trying to answer any question that you give it. And it will answer some questions in very strange ways. For instance, one of the, the ways that people kind of use to prove that it doesn't really have knowledge is they asked it, how many eyes does your foot have? And because, uh, you know, it's you, you know, normally people ask, you know, when people ask how many eyes an animal has, they would say, okay, two eyes. So it would respond, your foot has two eyes. It doesn't have this kind of logical framework of the world to understand what eye, what has eyes or what doesn't. Um, but it can produce, you know, questions and you can actually, apparently you can produce it. You can train it to, and some people have done this, I've seen where they've trained it to, um, figure out logical flaws in its answers in a way so it can be trained further all right i, I this i'm going to move on but you can see you can play with it uh this is a good example of kind of how it has mo how it has this knowledge of how it can take a prompt and kind of run with it um and it can it its capabilities are quite remarkable 
Um, so let's go back to the, the presentation. Um, okay. So, um, so, you know, I, I think a lot of people are fascinated by this uh, because this is, I, there's even, there, this is one of the first times I've seen people really debate seriously on, on Twitter or online, if this is approaching uh, the Turing test, uh, because I guess people have started to do some sort of analysis about whether people can determine the text that this model produces as computer generated. And it's about 50-50. Um, when people read an essay or something by it, they they don't know. So it's getting to be close, and that's causing people to debate philosophically. You know, what is uh, the Turing test? For people who aren't familiar, the Turing test is this idea that if you could have a conversation with a computer and not recognize whether it was a computer or whether it was uh, human, then 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 you could say that uh, computers have achieved artificial intelligence. Although there's a lot of pushback against this because this whole model is is all designed about mimicking a uh, human generated text it, it explicitly doesn't have any understanding of the world although there's there's some arguments about maybe that is a misunderstanding that maybe our brains work in this type of algebraic computational way I although I don't I don't think that's the case but um, anyway it's it's causing people to 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 debate this. And I, I think for a lot of people, they've always been interested in this question. I mean, I remember when I was a kid first learning programming, I was trained, or I, all the computer books that would give you programs to write would have this Eliza. People remember this, this basic program of Eliza, which was a psychiatrist that would uh, have a conversation with you. And I think that maybe, you know, there's this desire to have some sort of companionship or this uh, this idea of finding creativity in the machine we've seen how these style transfer programs have creativity and this this thing obviously is produced it, it has what we would think of as human creativity um, and what's also interesting is that this this model does not just produce uh, written text it can be trained to produce all types of other uh, textual based, uh, things and it's apparently been um, since it's it's gone through the internet. It's it's actually uh, looked at things that aren't traditional text. So, for instance, it can produce uh, guitar tabs. It can produce computer code. It can produce latex format text. Uh, it has these remarkable capabilities, and people have um, used it to generate all these different types of. Um, of computer code and other types of things that programmers would use. And obviously programmers are interested in making their lives easier. So uh, people have um, trained it now to produce uh, JSX and React code uh, to the point where you can even describe sort of what you want it to create and it will create it. Like somebody told it to create a to-do app with the ability to delete items and add items. And it actually created functional code to do that. Uh, you can train it to cr to give it some chemical combustion reactions, uh, and it will it can create new reactions based off of novel formulas. Um, it's written a coherent philosophical essay about from the perspective of the GPT uh, model responding to philosophical critics about the capability of its intelligence. Um, hmm. It's written SQL queries based off of natural language, uh, natural language uh, uh, descriptions of what the query should be. It produces legitimate SQL queries. Um, it can produce charts in different uh, chart uh, programs like in Python and um, Seaborn and things like that. Um, and it also it can do more practical things for humans like take legal text and make it understandable, translating legalese. And if you Google these things, you'll find all these examples. A lot of people right now, it's just people who create like a video of an app doing this and it's, uh, they post it on Twitter or something like that. But there are a lot of repositories of people who are um, experiment or who are showing off what they've done. Um, I'm, so, I'm starting to see the ethical issues that could come with using something like this. From yeah, we're about we're it's about to get to that. Yeah, it is. It is a bit. It's it's frightening, and and there's a lot of 
negatives downsides. Um, and, and that's actually going to be the, my next my next slide. And we, and I want to have a lot of discussion on that. So just for myself, my when I've been playing with it a lot, mostly through the AI dungeon. Um, and you can I mean, you can literally spend hours and hours on this thing because anything in your imagination, you can create that scenario. And there's actually a realistic response. I mean, if you're a creative person who can create, you know, dreams in your head of different scenarios the, now you know it understands there are characters you can interact with them it uh, it can go back to something that happened um several pages ago and rem remember those details um so it's it really is mind-blowing and i think for especially for maybe the creative people who just will focus on that that potential of it and not only think about the instrumentality um and and what's interesting is even as I recognize this potential playing with it, you know, there's still this un, unclarity about what its most practical uses will be. One of the things that's sort of interesting about this, and maybe the reason why this open AI is pursuing it, but not necessarily the largest corporations, is that uh, it right now seems to have more importance as a novelty than it does as something practical, although that's being debated. Um, but uh, eventually, we I think people will will see it um, uh, having purposes. You know, programmers are starting to debate whether it it's going to this type of idea is going to affect their jobs down the line. Whether whether computer code can be uh, some of that will be abstracted away as well. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, you can see how it has a lot of it has some issues, especially with the storytelling. It has, sometimes has ADD. It doesn't always seem to like to keep the same like scene or scenario going, it often causes radical shifts into new directions. And there it may have to be trained. Some people have been debating about how it can, how it can sort of maybe the model can be adjusted to sort of have more long-term memory or the ability to sustain um, tension and drama for longer. Um, and then you can also see that it comes up with this fake information. Um, and it has a lot of negatives. One thing that I've noticed with the storytelling is a lot of violence and racism and sexism. I mean, it will often veer off if you're dealing with the character, especially a man and a woman, it will often veer off into violence against the women of sexual stuff. Uh, it's very, it's very aggressive. Um, and it's also very stupid. It doesn't really, it doesn't, I mean, sometimes it tends toward philosophical things, but they're often very cynical about the world like it often has things end in violence people not caring about you um and it you know one theory is that it's because it's trained on all this internet data and people on the internet maybe when they write are you especially emotionally disconnected or especially embrace violence maybe because it's more you know i don't know if it's reddit or wikipedia maybe it's trained especially on young men you know it's sort of biased toward younger men which is what the internet has been for most of its existence um so i don't know I, maybe before we move on uh, talk about other negatives i could open that up to conversation because i think um this this basic problem is going to have is going to persist in machine learning so yeah there were two other looking at the examples you listed before i thought of two other potential negative outcomes one was it could generate sql queries you could potentially like describe it to it like a network or database infrastructure and then say like give me a database a sql query that will like hack into the database or delete this data so it could use uses like a structure to build you know attacks on databases potentially depending on like how complex they are but it could like right it could open up to like anyone without programming experience to hack basic or even more complex databases right or yeah you and yeah, or it might be able to see the weakness in a in a in a, a structure if you gave it a structure of of computers or network, it might be able to see flaws that you, other people wouldn't. Yeah, Tom, did you did you mention what the uh, what the architecture is for this thing? I don't know if I missed that slide. Yeah, people are saying that they well, in terms of the 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 um, computing right now, people say that they've had to create some special. Um, type of supercomputer with a huge amount of memory to deal with it. I guess that's the biggest problem is that the model is so large that they that that m the memory um, is the biggest issue. Yeah, um, I mean, 
So is it uh, is it a series of neural networks or something? Yeah, like it's, this? it's 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 basically it's a type of neural network. I mean, that's the easiest way to 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 think about it. They call the architecture transformer architecture, right? And, they, and then in terms of the training, they've done some parallel process. They've done some innovations in terms of parallel processing with the, the computers that they had to use. And you know, they had to use supercomputers that are, I think were funded by Microsoft in part. That's why they took a billion dollars from Microsoft last year in order to kind of scale this up. Um, but yeah, sorry to just jump in, but I think I think some some of the debate around just the architecture is that everyone thought you know neural networks can only have there's only so much data in the world that you can train it on, and there has to be some sort of like epoch or returning uh, or diminishing returns. And it appears that we're not sure yet, right? If anything, maybe more more data actually is better. So right, which is which is actually sort of worrisome because it means that powerful entities like everything else we're seeing in our society may may control these things. You know, I mean, for, in this case, for instance, they didn't release the model, which is something that has in the in the past AI research, especially a lot of Google's AI research has been premised on releasing the model so that people can use it in their own ways. And they're not releasing it. And I, I believe OpenAI said that they their goal was to create these things and then release them. Right. Yeah, well, it's kind of, and it's interesting. I mean, yeah, their their whole name of their organization is Open AI, which was supposed to deal with the ethics of it. You know, Elon Musk is famous for saying AI is going to kill us all, and yet even this nonprofit or this kind of pseudo benevolent organization that was supposed to be directed at that has now created this proprietary system that has these huge obvious flaws and is is looking to, I think, turn it into a product in the near future. Yeah. Um, as a as a paid AI, as a paid API. Do we know what computer this is running on? Um, you know, as we as somebody mentioned, it's it's a special supercomputer with a lot of memory, and then it uses these new GPUs. I think, yeah. like, basically. Where is it located? Uh, Undisclosed. I don't, Undisclosed California. <laughs> Who knows? Um, all right, well, I'll go through some of the other negatives. Another negative that, that I'm kind of interested in is this environmental issue. Um, because it seems kind of interesting that to to just create a little sentence or, you know, to have these programs. Some people say that, you know, like a Google search is uses an extraordinary amount of electricity. Imagine, you know, this now that you're, you're just cutesying around playing this adventure game, but we don't even know how much you know, electricity and, and supercomputer uh, power this is requiring. And it to me, it sort of reminds me of blockchain in the sense of just to do a financial transaction now, we have to have this huge network of, uh, of miners around the world that's using more power than a country. Um, and so is that is is that going to happen for a lot of the uses of that and, and even for intellectual production now that it's going to require this huge, these huge, um, a huge energy intensive uh, calculations. Um, next, obviously, the other is job loss. You know, people are already starting to worry that this is going to affect uh, journalists. I don't know. I, I, I'm a little bit dubious of it. And somebody pointed out that they said, well, the only way that this works and eliminates programmers is if you assume that somebody can create an actual schema for what they want for like a website or something like that. And what we often find out as designers or, or, or web developers is that the code ends up being the, the schema in a certain degree. The only schema that actually is precise to what people want is ultimately the code. But I don't know, you're, you're seeing some examples. Like one, uh, one thing that was, one thing that a lot of people have been pointing to is you can tell it to, this maybe this doesn't resolve the question, but you could you can tell it to create a button that's like a watermelon, and it will then create a button with a pink inside and a green border. You know, it can it can actually creatively take uh, a direction and sort of exp and and interpret it um, into very into specifics. Next mm -hmm. negative is spam and fake news. And I think this is gonna go through the roof. I mean, we're already dealing with this whole Russian hackers and Twitter bots that are instigating division in our society, which is kind of the theory. Imagine now if we have this division, this these bots instigating division in our society 
that's been trained on all of the internet data of how to insult people and to instigate division and actually seems to have awareness of what are the political uh, fronts. It's yeah, that, sorry, that actually made me like think of similar to something I thought before was that it opens the door for a lot of social engineering as well because yeah. you could feed a, like information about like if you have messages that someone has sent, you can feed them information about what they've sent before and then they can build a profile of what they message oh, yeah. like have them impersonate someone else and to exactly. see if other people do digital media. No, and, and actually there are some examples of that. It's very good at producing text similar to the text that you normally produce. That combined so. with uh, deep fakes, like we could we could all be, you know, AI right now. Yeah. Very possible. <laughs> That, yeah, that's this exactly can, what would say. and then you have the deep fake in the, creating real time video with the deep fake. I mean, it, it can, it's going to get pretty scary. You can just generate a video of any politician saying anything you want, and it sounds just like them in every way. Yeah. Exactly, and you know this will be it'll produce the text, and and I think a lot of it will not necessarily be the the tricking people, but it's just going to be the overwhelming our our popular discourse with noise mm -hmm. that we're going to be so overwhelmed with with bots creating you know f fake comments fake stories to generate traffic all for this whole you know these weird incentive systems that we have in the internet which is eyeballs are good responsiveness is good like let's say you wanted to build a youtube channel you could create you could have a bunch of bots you know that watch the videos and comment on them to trick youtube's algorithms things like that um and then the last uh, example, the, the one negative is that it, there is, we have to keep in mind, it's still a little bit hard to see the full potential of this because so a lot of these examples that I've been giving um, may have been produced after people tried a bunch of failures. And, you know, we already saw it just now where we were having some difficulty coming up with things. So it may not be as reliable as people think. Um, any other comments about these negatives. Okay. So I also wanted to show, um, oh, I go back to the, also just wanted to show um, the Python um, library that OpenAI is saying that they can do. So you basically, it's quite simple. I mean, this is what, this is just like, you know, it's, uh, it's really, uh, it doesn't require a lot of machine learning knowledge to play with this. Uh, you just you import the library, you, you create a prompt variable, um, you, you tell it to create uh, a response using a particular model, you give it the prompt, you tell it to stop with, with, um, with new lines. Uh, you give it this temperature uh, variable or parameter, which is apparently kind of, they call it in the open, in the, um, in the dungeon app, they call it sort of randomness. And I guess it's the degree to which it can vary from the script or, or vary or kind of has a chaotic element to it that will to create novelty. And, and they are using one as the default, but you can um, you can adjust it. Um, and then you can and then you tell it the, the maximum number of tokens that it can return and it will then create whatever its response is. And here's an example of, you know, you starting talking about this new API and it creates some text about um, what the AI will, what, what the, uh, the value of AI. Um, and then here's an example of it uh, correcting text. And just like we did with the uh, Q and A, you know, you give it a prompt where it describes, uh, it kind of sets up a structure between the, the poor English and the corrected English. And then you would give it more poor English and it would then correct that we could, you know, we could try that in the options, but you know, it's, it's very, uh, it's very simple and straightforward. So, so I wanted to have, um, I guess, kind of have a discussion about it's for whatever time we have about how this could be used for makers. I mean, do people have creative projects that they're thinking about, or are they, or are they more worried about the societal implications? Uh, of it all, uh, I could see you know I could see lots of interesting projects coming from uh, you know th from the artistic perspective, from robots, 
uh, for 3D printing, for virtual reality of scenario making. But I, I just I know that there's going to be a lot of things. So I wanted to yeah. to open it up. So, so I mean, just my thought is I get a lot of people stuck on what they should do as a project. So you could have like an oracle in the space that you walk up to and just like ask what you should do next. What should I make? What should I build? Well, you can like, tell it. I have skills. You a project. Yeah. yeah you, you could tell it. I have skills as a programmer and a wood wood maker. You know. Yeah. And then it will say, go build a whatever. And it could like describe it loosely. Yeah. I sort of have a, have a question for you. Todd. Yeah, like, sure. The, uh, the thing you were playing with before, uh, the dungeon thing. Yeah. There was a part of it where I think uh, it was going to train on some text that you were putting into it. Is there like a transfer learning version of GPT-3? Is there, or do you, do you know? This um, person has access to the API. Okay. So, so it they, lets you sort of put text into it and then get related uh, responses? Well, what, what it tries to do essentially is complete the text. Interesting. So it's all probabilistic. It's taking text and then th using its extensive model, coming up with the most what it what its model has trained it to be as how it could complete it. So a lot of ways, for instance, if you're playing the dungeon game and you want it to do certain things, you kind of one easy way is to create a sentence that starts but doesn't complete the sentence. Like you say, you tell it and then you tell it to finish and it will it will it will describe what you said or something does that make sense so you want it yeah it, it's designed to to complete things in what probabilistically it determines is the most most appropriate completion the reason so i bring that up is cuz I, I think it'd be uh, really fun to take something as powerful as this and sort of limit it to a specific domain like let's say we had uh, we wanted to create a chatbot that knows uh, a lot about video games, and we wanted to train it on uh, video game literature, so that you know when you're chatting with it, it's got this you know gamer perspective to everything that you say. Right. Yeah, and I think um, that's something that people are a little bit unsure about, or they may have to alter it. How to kind of. Um, retrain the model. You know, a lot of people have been discovering now, as some people who follow machine learning may know, that you can um, you can take models that are already trained on data sets, you know, these huge data sets, and then train them on smaller data sets, um, and they'll work, you know, without uh, without you necessarily having to redo everything. Um, so yeah, that may be that might be effective um, in a specialized. Uh, domain of knowledge. But again, because people don't have access to the model, they can't do certain things like that right now. They can only access it through this API. Yeah, I, I wonder if um, instruction could be done. Like, so, you know, there's lots of tutorials on how to do things, and you could prompt it to give you instructions. Yeah, uh, within certain it's limits, actually, and then just follow the instructions, see where you come up it's with. It's very good at bullsh bullshitting. Uh, like r directions. And one thing I found remarkable is recipes. You can say, this is a recipe that combines, you know, eggs and pineapple or something. And mm -hmm. it will actually come up with a, you know, a, a novel recipe that, that, I mean, it might be terrible, but it, it, it will, you know, it will create a recipe using whatever ingredients you give it. Um, so you might, I don't know if it would know how to do so, you know, it, but if if it was if it had internalized how to do something in particular from its training, it might be able to do it. But so the problem with that is sometimes it'll it just will come up with something that looks good to it. Yeah. Can I uh, present a screen here for a minute? For yes, your, sure. For yeah, sure. How, Hang uh, on. Yeah, go ahead. Let me let me do it. Hopefully, I can do this. Oh, okay, get the wrong one. I'll do this. Here we go. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. Rich, here we go. And I mean, let me get it down to okay. this. This one. Can you see this okay. from MIT? Yeah. So uh, I subscribed to MIT uh, Technology Review. And uh, just a couple days uh, ago, uh, this came in. And um, it was a whole article on this. And uh, shockingly good and completely mindless. Right. And yeah. a, a lot of discussion. I don't know if any of you uh, subscribe. But if you go to MIT uh, Technology Review, you can find this article. And that's all. I just thought I'd just point that out if it might be. Yeah, I, re I read that article. And I think it talked about some of these, you know, these lack of common sense problems. And also yeah. this, this question of whether this, this technology will ever be, you know, production ready. Because it has these kind of f flaws and biases that might make it never really usable in a practical way. Well, it's definitely interesting. <laughs> yeah. And the scary thing is it, it, it does show, I think it does show some potential that's never going to go away. I think the world is going to be different in some ways post this technology, uh, no matter what happens. Um, so on that, that note... On that note, we will hopefully we can figure out some positive and creative uses to to do some projects with it, and and we will uh, try our best to mitigate the the negatives. So, well, that was good for me because yeah. I had n no knowledge. I mean, I didn't know what to expect on this whole thing. So, uh, I think I got a handle on it now. Okay, it's good. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like a random a random uh, text generator and that um, it's not completely random, it's obeying rules, and it's a contextualizer, and, yeah. and uh, it, it is creative in the sense, but then on the other hand, it might create garbage. <laughs> right. so. Yeah, and it's, it's been, tr and, it's, and, it's, and some people think of it as one way to think of it is it's just a reflection of, of humanity. You know, it's just taken all the junk that we've posted on the internet. And it's gonna it's, make a lot of, Go ahead. Is it, if it's a reflection on the internet, it's going to be making a lot of garbage then, probably. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think I remember there was a Microsoft uh, AI that was let loose on Twitter, and then uh, it started saying racist things, and they took it down like uh, a few years ago. Yeah. I yeah, I, I, and I'm surprised because I've been playing with it. This thing, what I've noticed is it's, at least in this AI dungeon, it's very violent. It, it always wants to kill things and it always causes whatever adventure I'm having, even if it's like something very benign, it will instigate violence. Hey, you know, it might be interesting if you got it to uh, take its attention off the internet and instead uh, focus it on the great books of, of, yeah. uh, of literature. Yeah. And then exactly. see what comes out of that, you know, put a quality source of, uh, information that it can you know play. i think they don't want to do that because they they want something that reflects the way people think now and the language people use now so the problem with that is we our society is kind of dumbing down you know we're losing grammar we're losing uh you know the ability to sustain long thoughts in the social media age we're not writing letters like we used to so the this these bots are going to increasingly reflect our you know, our mental capabilities and our, our, the way we use language now. Yeah. So I remember, uh, the reason I, I asked about the architecture of this thing is because, um, I'm familiar with word to vec and if anybody else is familiar with word to vec sort of creates, uh, relationships between words based on the input text, which is, yeah, I think it gives it this, that's a part of it. That's a part of it. Yeah. It gives it this semantic meaning to the words uh, based on the input text. I, th I think it'd be really interesting to be able to take what they did and uh, retrain it on different things uh, because you're gonna end up with words meaning different things based on the input. Yeah, I think they also minimize the vocabulary, I believe that they, um, when they started off, they, they reduce its vocabulary down to um, a certain number of let words. 
So I believe, I think I read somewhere it has a vocabulary of just 2,500 words. I would love to see a program that um, I can click on a word and then it would take me into um, uh, a dictionary and uh, uh, or, uh, or antonyms and synonyms and then I can click on that, anything in there and it would take me to the same thing on that word and then click on anything. I just would like to click all the way through the English language following a starting off with one word and just keep clicking through and see where the hell it goes <laughs> in terms of the genie the ge the the genealogy of the word no in terms of uh uh like you look up a word and let's say you get um uh 10 synonyms so you click on one of the synonyms and it takes you to another word and you get 10 synonyms there or you can go with the antonyms and just keep following. you can do that they have a there's a thing called wiki dictionary or wiktionary that's you kind of like that. that. In there? I'll have Wiki to, yeah. Wiki Wikipedia has I, like a dictionary where you can. Yeah, kind you of can just, I think I remember seeing uh, words of versions of that oh, too. Yeah. So, yeah. So those kind of uh, the relationships of words are closer based on how they're would, used in sentences, and that that ends up being super interesting. I would love to play with that. I love words. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we can we can stay on for any discussion, but I guess that that closes the uh, the meeting itself. Um, thanks, thank you, Jr. and Makehaven for putting this together. You have to go. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Todd, for uh, hosting the uh, for hosting the session. Thank you, Todd. And I will. Um, the one thing oh, I should note is if people want to use the AI dungeon, they actually have to pay. But you can uh, you can get a trial for a week, so you don't have to pay F if you just cancel much, after the trial. How much do you have to pay? Well, if you want to use it monthly, it's ten dollars a month. But you can pay, you can get a free trial for a week. Um, so we would have to have that to mess around with this right now, right? Yeah, and make sure that and if you do want to make do it, make sure that you t ch tell the model to be the dun the dragon because it has two models and it's the dragon one that uses the GPT three. Okay, well, if I decide to, Brendan and I will talk about it if we want to play with it. We're going to contact you, and you can tell us how to do yeah, it. Yeah, I could, I could <laughs> tell you, but it's, I, it is, I think it's worth playing with a little bit. Yeah, um, thank you for just uh, to give a sense of what's about to come all, all of our ways. Thank you for opening that window to us. That is really something uh, interesting. Okay, thank you much. My pleasure. I'm interested. By the way, I'm interested in music and and poetry so if anybody is curious about that that joe yeah that's one th uh thing i'm thinking about maybe taking a project is where you can go up to something and, and start a poem or a haiku or something like that so maybe i'll yeah. create or a uh, like that. you know whistle something at it and have it complete the tune that'd be cool yeah. <laughs> so i'd like to work on the oracle type or something like that where there's a little device and you speak into it and it can do different apps. Maybe we could even create an, an API or a platform for people to add their own apps or something like that. So. I like language. Like, let me just uh, say one of my favorite quotes. Okay. These are they who, when the saving thought came, shot it for a spy. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's a famous line from a famous poet. I won't tell you who. Okay. Brenda, did you enjoy it? Did I, you learn anything? I don't know. Oh, yes, very much so. Yes, I okay, enjoyed it good. very much. Good. Okay. Yeah, I was a little bit unsure what to do because a lot of the tech, I knew that going, trying to explain the neural network stuff would, would use too much time and it's confusing. So I just tried to kind of keep it focused on the practicalities, but I well, hope I covered it. Well, let's talk about that for a quick second. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so the neural network, we're not, what we're talking about are algorithms that uh, simulate a neural network. It's not really a computer that is wired as a neural network. Is, am I right? Well, the way to think about the, the reason that it's, they, people consider it neural networks is because it has these connections between the activation um, features right so you have you have neurons have uh 
have links between them, right? And they 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 fire and they activate. So dendrites, axons. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Dendrite, so it has yeah. it has that model. Although it doesn't. To, to, what the difference is is that our neurons in our brain don't really operate with you know, uh, floating point numbers no, no. <laughs> as weights. So the whole thing is kind of a bonus. Actually, actually <laughs> they don't even know how it works. You know, you could take a neural network and give it a, a, a pattern and, uh, and it'll figure out, it'll recognize things. And, but yet nobody can say, how the heck did it do that? But yeah. yet it'll do it. And I, I kind of believe that there's an, a certain arrogance in these tech people to try to call it a neural network because yeah, they, that's what they know. And it's also similar to, um, you know, even this idea of it's intelligent. I mean, is it really intelligent oh, yeah. to yeah. Uh, to to predict text based off of this huge, you know, brute force mechanism? when it has no real understanding of the relationship between anything, it's all this mathematical. I mean, are the human brain doesn't operate like that. We, our senses don't operate with that. We have a, we have a kind of a, an understanding of the world based off of vision and movement and touch. And we're able to kind of build our way up. We don't just raw calculate um, what a thing is and what, you know, who we are. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure we, these things deserve the word intelligence. I, I think that, yeah. Uh, one day when, when you have some time, I will tell you about, uh, my, uh, expert system that I built many, many years ago for, um, storage technology corporations, uh, computer, um, that they were building and how, I fed in all the data uh, as to how the machine, I built a database that was based on the structure of the machine right down to the gates. And then I ran some um, algorithms on it and it discovered, it was an expert system and it discovered 93 or 96, I don't remember exactly, problems in the machine that they didn't know they had. So, it was shocking for the company. And, yeah. And so it was shocking for them, but people were angry with me because I found all these problems. But on the other hand, other people said, you're a hero. How did you do that? Yeah. So, you know, I think one thing that is going to happen will be interesting with this. If it can generate code is people are going to start having it try to hack. You know, if you could create like a Docker model of a network and just give it infinite time to hack it in kind of a simulated space. It might, it may do like really um, extraordinary hacks. Oh, well, so I've always tried to avoid the hacking world. <laughs> I well, would get in serious trouble if I entered that world. I'm sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. What All about, right, well, hey, what yeah, about, yeah. what about your uh, ham radio? Maybe would you ever, have you ever encountered a, a machine learning? In the ham uh, world? No, I have not. That would be kind of interesting. Maybe we could build a bot where people could talk to this device from the ham. Oh, Radio. that's interesting. If they came to it, they could start talking to this AI we've created. Well, you know, there's so uh, speech to text. I mean, that would be the first thing is you tune into a microphone and get the text. Right, that's easy. That problem yeah, that part's done, you know. Yeah. yeah, that problem's been solved. Yeah. So well anyway, I'm not I'm not gonna um occupy any more time here and just say thank you so much. No, I, yeah, I, was, I hope you enjoyed it. We that. shall meet again, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Brenda. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Okay, bye bye.